Good morning. My name is Fred Spain. I am an elder at Redwood Church in Redwood City, California. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be here today to share a message that God has laid on my heart. I have known Josh for eight, ten years now, and uh, it's been a privilege to know him and to share some ministry with him. Today we want to spend some time and we want to talk about some lessons from Jesus' final 40 days on the earth. So I've titled this lesson, Disrupted. Lessons from Jesus' final 40 days on earth after his resurrection. As you know, Jesus' ministry began with 40 days in the wilderness. He started off his ministry going into the wilderness without food, without water, and being tempted by Satan in order to prepare him and get him ready for the ministry that he would have, his earthly ministry that he would have with his disciples here on earth. But he ended his time on earth with 40 days. 40 days of prepping his disciples, getting them ready so that they could continue on with the ministry. Today, we're going to take a look at the empty tomb. We're going to take a look at what the two Marys saw when they visited the empty tomb. I'd like for us to take a moment and read through Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. But before we jump right into reading that, I want to set the stage a little bit, and I want for us to think about what happened on Saturday before the resurrection. Now, this Saturday was the Sabbath, and everybody was supposed to be chilling on this Saturday because it was the Sabbath. But our Pharisees, those sneaky guys, went and had a meeting with Pilate because they said that they remembered that while Jesus was living, he said that after three days he was going to rise again. And so they went to Pilate and they convinced Pilate that something must be done to make sure that those deceivers, is what they called the disciples, those deceivers, those liars, we want to make sure that they don't come and steal the body and take it away. And so Pilate told him, go ahead and secure the tomb as best as you possibly can. And so these Pharisees went and secured the tomb and Pilate gave them guards to watch the tomb. So the tomb was sealed and there were guards watching the tomb. And so the stage is set for what's going to happen on resurrection morning. So in Matthew chapter 28, verses one through 10, we find after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the door had come down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and they became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there 
they will see me. So we remember what happened on the Sabbath, right? And now it's resurrection morning. And the title of my sermon is Disruption. And so the first, from verses two through four, I have kind of encapsulated that section of scripture as the disruption. So what happened? What was this disruption? Well, first of all, the scripture tells us that there was a violent earthquake. The scripture tells us that an angel from the Lord had come down and he had rolled the stone away from the tomb. And then he sat on it. He sat on the stone. As we read through this, sometimes it's very easy to just blow past these small things, but they make a significant difference if we take some time and we stop and we look to see what's going on. So why did the angel roll the stone away from the tomb? Was it necessary to roll the stone away in order for Jesus to get out? No, later on we're gonna find that one of the things that Jesus did was he went and he visited the disciples who were locked up in a room and he just appeared right in the middle of them. Nobody opened the door for him. He just appeared right in the midst of them. So why did the angel roll the stone away from the tomb? I believe the angel rolled the stone away from the tomb so that the women could see. So that they could see that the tomb was empty. And not only the women, but the people that came after the women to look into the tomb so that they could see that the tomb was empty. Because he told them straight up, he said, hey, look, come and look for yourself. The tomb is empty. He's not there. He's risen from the dead. And so the angel rolled the stone away, not for his own benefit, not for God's benefit, but for our benefit so that we could see and so that we could know beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus wasn't there. Now remember what happened on Saturday. On Saturday, the Pharisees, these ones that believe in the resurrection, had gone and they'd made a deal with the Roman authorities to seal the tomb. Well, guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work. They put a seal on the tomb and they put two guards in front of the tomb and they put a big stone in front of the tomb and it still didn't work. They couldn't keep Jesus in that tomb. No matter what they did, they couldn't keep Jesus in that tomb. So why did the soldiers faint? Why did these big strapping men, you know, in my mind as I was thinking about these two guards that were standing in front of the tomb, I thought about uh, uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, and, and Vin Diesel. And so you got these two guys patrolling the front of the tomb and they're supposed to make sure that nobody came and stole the body, nobody could get out and nobody could get in. But these guys fainted. Why did the guards faint? These guys are no match for an angel from God. They're no match for God's angels. They can't, these guys fell down and fainted at the sight of one of God's angels. One of the things that happens in our world today is a lot of people have a, a, a soft kind of a feeling about God's angels and really even sometimes about Christians. I played a part of an angel in a Christmas play one time. Yeah, that's right, me, don't laugh. I play the part of an angel. But guess what, I was a military angel. I was a military angel, which really in a lot of ways is more akin to what God's angels probably were. These guys were scary. These guards fell down, they fainted when they saw these angels. And most of the time when a human encountered an angel, one of the first things that the angel would say is, don't be afraid, because those guys are scary. The reason these soldiers fell down is because they were no match for God's angels. They were no match for what God was getting ready to unleash, not only on them, but on all of Satan's hosts. 
So why was the angel sitting on the boulder? Right? Think about that. I mean, he rolled it away and he could have just gone on about his business, but not only did he roll the boulder away, he then sat on it. Why do you sit on it? Some, some people believe that the reason that he sat on it was to show that what God was doing had been completed and now he could maybe rest again. Other people believe that one of the reasons that the angel sat on the boulder was because of what it talks about in Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, it says that in the cross, Christ disarmed the evil powers. Christ disarmed Satan. And not only did he disarm him, but he made a public spectacle of Satan. So when Jesus rose from the dead, when Jesus rose from the dead, Satan was exposed for who he really is. You see, when it comes to being able to deal with God, Satan can't deal with God. In the same way that these guards couldn't handle the Lord's angel, Satan can't handle God. Satan can't even get close. And so this angel might have been kind of doing one of these numbers to Satan. Is that the best you got? Is that all you can do? Bring it. Where is it? Satan took his best shot and it wasn't good enough because Jesus was raised from the dead. He made a public spectacle of Satan when he was raised from the dead. He disarmed him. And everybody saw it. And everybody knew about it. In the second section of scriptures, in verses 5 and 6, we see the angel entertain the women. So when the women came, the angel, one of the first things the angel did was he told them, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He didn't say that to the guards. When he came, notice the angel didn't tell the guards not to be afraid because he wanted them to be afraid. But he told the women not to be afraid. He said, come and see. Come and investigate for yourself. Come in and take a look and investigate for yourself. Who, he, who are you looking for again? Oh, you're looking for Jesus? Well, he's not here, but I want you to come and I want you to see for yourself. You know, I believe that God makes that same call to every one of us to come and see, to come and investigate. Look and find out for yourself. Is the tomb empty? Do you know how much evidence there is to support the fact that the resurrection really occurred? That Jesus actually died, which is what he also says. He says, look, you're coming here to find Jesus and he was crucified, but he's not here. He's risen. He is risen. So why was the tomb empty? Why was the tomb empty? The tomb was empty for us. And the door, the stone was rolled away so that we could see, so that we could know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the tomb was empty. And who were the women looking for when they went there? This really got me when I really sat down and started thinking about this. But the women went to the tomb looking for dead Jesus. The women went to the tomb looking for dead Jesus. Man, that gave me the chills. Because I believe sometimes we also, when we look in the wrong places, we're looking for a dead Jesus. We're not looking for the risen Lord. We're not looking for our Savior. We're looking for something that, that we might be able to, you maybe do something. They came and they wanted to bring the rest of the embalming things so that they could, you know, take care of the body. No, Jesus doesn't need us to take care of him. He's taking care of us. That's why he wasn't there. It's so that he could take care of us. And so the angel invited the women to come and see. 
So what was he really inviting the women to see? What was, what was it that the angel wanted the women to see and to know? He wanted them to see and to know the good news, right? He wanted them to see and to know that Jesus had been crucified because he says that there in verse six, I believe. And he wanted them to know that Jesus had been buried because he was in that tomb. Because the angel said, he's not here anymore, but he was here and he is now risen. Isn't that the core of what the gospel message is? Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, these are the things that I preach to you as of first importance that Christ died and he was buried and on the third day he rose again. And so the angel was inviting the women to come and to see and to understand the good news. Hey, ladies, I've got good news for you. There's no need for you to be afraid. I've got good news for you. He's not there anymore. Wow, what a powerful message. What a powerful message. You know, when we slow down and we take a look at all the things that are happening on this morning, we started this lesson off talking about disrupted. Were these lives, were these women's lives disrupted? They came to the tomb to embalm Jesus, but he wasn't there. That's a significant disruption. The angel told him to come and investigate for yourselves. And then the next thing he told him, the next chunk of verses, verses seven through 10, he tells him to go and tell. Come and see, come and see for yourself. Now that you've seen, I want you to go and tell. These women had an urgent mission. Once they had the information that they needed, once that they understood that Jesus Christ had been crucified, he had been buried and he had risen, he told them, go and tell. Come and see, now go and tell. It's not time to stand around now. It's not time to just kind of, oh, be lackadaisical about it. This is important information that the rest of the disciples need to know. Because where were they? They were locked in a room, afraid of what the Jews were going to do to them. And so these women came and they saw for themselves. And then they had to go and they had to tell the rest of the people. The angel sent these women on an urgent mission. Wow. That really says it all, doesn't it? It says it all. Once these women saw that Jesus had risen, they were on an urgent mission. Do we get that same kind of an urgency about our response, response to the resurrection? Do we have that same kind of urgency? Notice these women, it says here in the scripture that they hurried after the angel told them that. And then in the next verse, it says that they ran. It also says that they were, were afraid, but they were full of joy. These women did not let their fear stop them from accomplishing their mission. They didn't let their fear keep them from accomplishing their mission. Man, what a message for us, right? We cannot let our fear keep us from accomplishing the mission that God has given to us. And even more than that, these women did not allow their fear to keep them from seeing God, from seeing Jesus as he was. Because as they were running, and all this fear and all this joy and all this excitement as they're running down the road. They recognize Jesus. In fact, it says that they grabbed onto his feet and that they fell down and they worshiped him. I'm going to tell you, we get distracted sometimes and we lose sight of who Jesus really is. 
of what he really wants from us and what he really wants for us to do. But these women did not lose sight of God. They knew who he was when they saw him. And they fell down and they worshiped him in spite of their fear. They recognized him and they fell down and they worshiped him. So what are the lessons that we can take away today from this section of scriptures? Lesson number one, God doesn't want to just interrupt our lives. He wants to disrupt our lives. He doesn't want to come in and just have us, you know, run over one of these giant speed, dump, speed bumps in the parking lot and just kind of slow us down a little bit, and maybe put us off course when we try to go around it or whatever. He wants disruption. And if we truly allow Jesus the time and the attention that he is due, I'm telling you, that's a disruption in your life. Your life will change directions once God gets a hold to it, if we let him. And that's a big message for us as we look at this section of scriptures today. God doesn't want to just interrupt us and then let us go on back to business as, as usual. He wants to disrupt us. And the reason that he wants, us, wants to disrupt us is because he wants us to stop what we're doing. He wants us to stop. Because sometimes Jesus kind of gets our attention, but we're busy and he doesn't really get it all. I keep thinking about Moses in the middle of the desert and there's this bush burning, but it wasn't burning up. And Moses had to stop what he was doing so that he could go over and, and kind of give this bush his full attention. For the most part, we've all been disrupted because of the coronavirus. I mean, we still do a lot of the things that we need to do. A lot of people and other people have been even more impacted than that. But what God wants truly is for us to be disrupted so that we can stop and really think about, hey, what is going on in my life? You know, I've been doing this and doing this and there's real, real good reason for it. Maybe I need to stop doing this and do something else. But God wants us to stop. He wants to disrupt us so that we will stop. And listen to this. He wants us to stop looking for life in dead places and in dead things. You see, that's one of the disruptions that the resurrection should bring to us all, is that we stop and we stop looking for life in dead places and in dead things. And then number two, the second reason that God wants to disrupt our lives is he wants us to learn from our mistakes. You see, if we don't get disrupted sometimes, we make mistakes and then we just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. I, I have a, a, a song that I listen to, it's called Cycles by Jonathan McReynolds. And in that song, he has a phrase that really kind of haunts me. And he talks about how the devil learns from your mistakes, even if you don't. You see, God wants us to stop so that we can learn from our mistakes and then do something different, but not make those mistakes anymore. He wants us to stop and it takes disruption sometimes for that to happen. And then finally, he wants us to make permanent changes in our lives. He disrupts us so that we can make permanent changes. I know a number of people as a result of the disruption that we've had from the coronavirus, I know a number of people who said, you know, I'm never gonna go back to doing that again. There are, there are people who have gone out of business and they're saying, I'm not gonna go back and do that business anymore. I'm gonna do something different. And I believe that God wants the same thing from us. He disrupts so that we can seriously think about what we're doing so that we can change and do something that's more in line with what he wants from our lives. Lesson number two, God wants us to discover life in the living Jesus. In the living Jesus. 
not in the dead Jesus that the women thought were going to be in the tomb, but he wants us to discover life in the living Jesus. There's a movie about uh, a walk-on football player that played at the University of Arkansas. His name was uh, Brandon Burleson, I believe is his name. And in that movie, Brandon died. And when his coach, his high school coach, was asked how he was making it now uh, that this tragic thing had happened and that Brandon died. And listen to what the coach said. He said, I'm sure that I'll get over Brandon's death, but I'm not sure I'll ever get over his life. You know, Jesus, you know, expects us to get over the fact that he died, but we should never get over the fact that he's still alive. You see, it's his life that gives us life. His death and then his resurrection. And that's where we need to focus. What are those life things? What are those ways that Jesus imparted life to his disciples and to all of the people that he came into contact with? That's what he wants from us. That's a lesson that we need to learn from the resurrection is that it's his life that really matters. And that's what he had to come back and explain to the disciples. So these 40 days, he had to come back and he said, look, I'm alive. Yes, I've got wounds, I've got scars, but I'm alive. This is life. And this is what we need to be doing. And then lastly, lesson number three, God has an urgent mission for us and we can't let fear stop us. As a, as a church, as individuals, we all have a cross, we all have a mission and we cannot let fear stop us from accomplishing that mission. So what can we do in order to be able to, to deal with the fear, in order to be able to accomplish the things that God wants us to do? Well, number one, I believe we, we just need to get moving. Sometimes we know the right things to do, but we're paralyzed because of our fear, or we're, para, you know, we're paralyzed, and we don't know what to do. But sometimes we just need to do what we know to do. I tried real hard not to steal the Nike, the Nike thing and just do it. But really, that's what it boils down to. I love to watch uh, these car restoration shows. And in one of the shows, it was very interesting. There was a man that owned a car shop and his, one of his best friends owned a car shop, but his best friend died. And he left the shop and some really nice cars to his daughter. Well, his daughter didn't know what to do with these things. And so this man's friend said, okay, look, I'll, I'll take this off your hand and I'll make sure that nobody takes advantage of you. And so they were able to dispose of most of the stuff except for this one favorite car. That one favorite car sat for six years before the daughter finally was saying, look, I really need for you to do something with this car so that we can get it sold so that I can you know, get some money out of this and, and kind of clear things up. And he said, you know, I've been paralyzed with fear because I was afraid that I wouldn't do it in a way that would bring honor to my friend that died. But once I got started on it, hey, th this is turning out great. The whole time, those six years, he was in fear and all that had to happen was for him to get started on the project. Sometimes for us, in order to be able to deal with our fears, we just need to get started. We just need to get going. We just need to do what we know we need to do. Secondly, we need to be like Jesus and we need to focus on joy. We need to focus on joy. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about that Jesus was able to overcome. Jesus was able to overcome ridicule and so many other things because of the joy that was set before him. When we look at our lives and we look at some of the obstacles that we conjure up in our own minds when we're faced with different things, hey, there has to be 
some other thing out there driving us. And for us as God's people, it's the joy of knowing that I did something that made God happy. I did something that my father was pleased with. And so we need to focus on that joy just like Jesus. And then lastly, we need to focus on Jesus, right? Right there in that same passage in Hebrews, it says that we need to fix our eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith. If you really want to get beyond fear, if you really want to move in the way that God wants you to move, then focus your mind and your heart on Jesus. Well, I want to bring this to a conclusion. And, um, you know, these last 40 days, Jesus' last 40 days were pretty incredible. This is just one lesson out of a series of lessons that I have that talk about different encounters that Jesus had over the course of the last 40 days. And these last, those last 40 days were so critical and they were so important. Again, in that same movie that I mentioned before, Greater is the name of the movie with Brandon Burleson. So Brandon was a walk-on at the University of Arkansas. And being a walk-on means that you don't have a scholarship. Well, Brandon had actually earned a scholarship to a different school, but he didn't want to go to that school. From a, from, from a little kid, he always said, I'm going to be an Arkansas Razorback. I'm going to play for the Hogs. And that was his dream, and that's what he wanted to do. And he refused to accept anything other than playing for the Arkansas Razorbacks. Well, his older brother was really upset with him because the mom was a single mom and their family wasn't very rich and she couldn't afford it. And so in order to help her son accomplish his dream, the mom took out a second loan against her house in order to give her son one year at the University of Arkansas. And so he had one year to parlay into a full scholarship or he would not, not be able to stay at the University of Arkansas. He earned the opportunity to play in the last game of the year. While they're sitting in the stands at the game, the oldest brother says to his mom, Mama, do you think that this one game is worth 20 years of debt? Do you think this one game is worth 20 years of debt? And the mother's response is golden. She said, my son knows that I have faith. My son knows that I have faith. Jesus spent 40 days, 40 days after the resurrection to make sure that his disciples knew that he had faith in them to accomplish the mission that he had placed before him. Do you know that God has faith in you? The question is, do you have faith in God? Do you trust him? Are you willing to let him disrupt your life? Are you willing to come and to investigate so that you can find out for yourself? And then are you willing to accept the mission that he might put into your hands? We want to thank you so much for being with us today. Like I said, it's a privilege and honor for me to come and be able to speak to you. And it's my prayer that you have been blessed by being with us today. Thank you.